Grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Before you sit down, the psalmist in Psalm 116, he says this. He says, I love the Lord because he has heard my voice and my pleas for mercy. Words of gratitude, words of thanksgiving. Let us pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. Good be seen. Well, ten lepers are on the outskirts of town. Due to their infection, to their deformity, and their contagion, they keep their distance, and you want them to. The law demands that lepers are not to engage with others except to warn them of their presence by shouting with their hand over their mouth, unclean, unclean. And when that is heard, everyone steered clear. However, when the ten, when they learn that Jesus is approaching, they offer a plea for help. This is what mercy means. Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. Help us. This prayer, this prayer of the ten lepers has actually been incorporated into our liturgy. It's called the Kyrie, and you sang a version of it already this morning. Another version, when the pastor says, In peace let us pray to the Lord. The congregation then responds with, Lord have mercy. Right, and then he goes through. For this holy house and for all who offer here their worship and praise, Lord, have mercy. It's as if Jesus were standing before us when we make these pleas for mercy. It's because He is. The lepers call out, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. So what will Jesus do? Is He going to avoid them like everybody else? Well, of course not. Jesus hears them. He sees them. And he responds, for he is the merciful one to all those who call upon him. Yet, our Lord does not immediately heal. He could have, but in keeping with Old Testament law, he tells the lepers to show themselves to the priests who would then examine them head to toe, perform the rite of cleansing, and this rite lasted eight days, and who afterward would pronounce them clean, so that they could, of course, rejoin society. Now, priests knew how to do this from Leviticus chapter 14. They no doubt read it, but they never needed to use it. They never needed to. Because outside of Moses uh, contracting rather leprosy for just a few moments, if you remember that, Moses' sister Miriam getting leprosy and then being healed, and then Naaman having it, the one who was told to dip himself into the Jordan River seven times, picturing baptism. Outside of those three, no one was ever healed of leprosy. Even though plenty of people contracted it, and when they did, it was seen as a curse. Let's go back to Psalm 116. Listen to a little bit more. It begins, I love the Lord because He has heard my voice and my pleas for mercy. Because He inclined His ear to me, therefore I will call on Him as long as I live. The snares of death encompassed me. The pangs of Sheol laid hold on me. I suffered distress and anguish. Then I called on the name of the Lord. O oh Lord, I pray, deliver my soul. Gracious is the Lord and righteous, for our God is merciful. Gang, we simply cannot escape the fact that we have contracted a disease as well. And it's far worse 
than leprosy. I'm referring to the sinful spiritual disease that dwells in our own flesh, in the flesh of all people. It's the infectious, inherited corruption that runs through our race that was passed on to us from Adam and Eve after they fell into sin. This disease is the source of every wicked work, every vile word, every disgusting thought. Now, if I could cut it out of you, I would. If I could cauterize it, I would. If I could radiate it, eradicate it, obliterate it out of you, I would tie you down and do it. But those procedures will not work for the soul. They will not work in dealing with the awful disease of sin. This is something only God can do. Well, Jesus tells the lepers to go, and they do. And as they're going, they're healed. Feeling returns. Skin is restored. Extremities like fingers and toes and noses, they reconstitute. I don't think we realize how devastating leprosy is. We just hear the word and think, oh, it sounds bad, like it's eczema. Fingers fall off. Noses fall off. I read a story once where the feeling in the hands go so that the rodents, when they would come and start nibbling on the fingertips, you wouldn't feel them. But all of this reconstitutes as they're going. It's miraculous. Contagion is gone. And what was considered this curse by God it's removed. As the men feel it and as they see it in each other happening to them, my guess is they start running faster. Sprinting, getting to the temple and being declared A-OK -okay by the priest meant they could go back home. To the hug, hugs of children, the affection of wives, they could go back to work, they could see their parents, they could go to the market, they could go to the synagogue. Everything previously lost would be received again. But in all of the excitement, in all of the euphoria, there's one, there's a Samaritan who stops and he turns and he goes back to Jesus, the one who is the giver of the gift itself. Now look, it's a long story. You don't want to hear it, and I don't want to get into it, but essentially the Jews had no dealings with the Samaritans. I think you know that. Jews and Samaritans even worshipped at two separate temples on two different mountains. For the Jews, it was Mount Moriah in Jerusalem. For the Samaritans, it was Mount Gerizim in Shechem. So as the previously leprous Jewish men, they run to the temple in Jerusalem, where was the previous leprous Samaritan going to run to? I mean, the Samaritan couldn't go to the temple in Jerusalem. Was he going to go to the temple on Mount Gerizim and present himself there? He doesn't ask. And his actions, they are the scandal of this text. While the Jews run off to the temple, which was a type and a shadow pointing to Jesus Christ, the Samaritan runs to Christ himself which is the true temple of God. Christ is the temple to whom the one in Jerusalem always pointed. This is exactly what Jesus told the woman at the well, if you remember that. Woman, says Jesus, believe me, the hour is coming when neither on this mountain, referring to Mount Gerizim, nor in Jerusalem, you will worship the Father. And here we have this Samaritan, previously cursed by leprosy, he is now bowing at the better temple. At a better temple than the one in Gerizim or the one in Jerusalem. He's bowing at the greater priest. You see, because type and shadow have given away 
to fulfillment to reality. Falling upon his face, the man thanks Jesus with his entire being. Folks, this man was dead, cursed. And Jesus brought him back to life. Death and resurrection. But not just in this earthly life, but in the life to come. Jesus tells him, your faith, says in the text, has made you well. Your faith has saved you. Are the words. You see, faith always has to have an object. And the object of this man's faith is the one who is standing right before him, Jesus. It's remarkable. As I said earlier, we are infected with a devastating disease of our own. It's called original sin, and it infects everyone from the moment of his conception. It has various symptoms, which, of course, St. Paul listed for us in our epistle reading. Adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lewdness, idolatry, sorcery, hatred, contentions, jealousies, outbirths of wrath, selfish ambitions, dissensions, heresies, envy, murders, drunkenness, rivalries, and the like. It's like it could have gone on. I'm not necessarily prepared to say this off, of, off the cuff, but you know how like when you see some drug that's being advertised on television and they'll say some of the side effects include blah, 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 blah. And you're like, oh, sign me up! These are the symptoms of original sin. St. Paul then tells us what the judgment of God is. He says, I tell you beforehand, just as I also told you in time past, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. But then, just like the ten lepers, Jesus comes to us through the word of his apostles and says, Repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. Whoever believes and is baptized is saved. There's the remedy to original sin. And so we're given faith and we're baptized, cleansed by Christ who made us clean. And even though we still carry around the leprous sinful flesh, we are clothed ultimately in the righteousness of Christ. Unclean to clean. Broken to heal. Outcast to restored. Dead to alive. And what is our response? Gratitude. Thanksgiving. That's why this text is always read at Thanksgiving. Back in Psalm 116, the psalmist asks this. After he says what he heard, says about the Lord hearing my pleas for mercy, he says this. What shall I render to the Lord for all of his benefits to me? What can I give the Lord? What can I give God? He says, I will lift up the cup of salvation. I will call on the name of the Lord. I will pay my vows to the Lord in the presence of all His people. Beloved, your merciful Lord Christ has come near you today, yet again, in word and in a few moments, in sacrament. He knows you need His forgiveness again. He knows you need His strength. He knows you need His grace. And He has all of that in abundance. He knows your flesh is strong and tugs at you to indulge in wickedness, to pursue your own self-interest, or to turn away from faith to indifference and unbelief. Yet He has come near to help, to forgive, and to strengthen. To receive your thanks as you gather around Him in His Eucharist, where He is truly present. And beloved, this is why you have returned, just like the Samaritan. Oh sure, there are plenty who think that hearing God's Word and receiving what Christ wants to give them through His means of grace isn't that important. 
I couldn't help but being reminded, and I'm sure that there's some faithful Christians who are doing this day. I'm sure of it. But as I pulled out of Charlotte, they had shut down part of the highway for thousands of joggers. Joggers. Who couldn't jog on any other day than Sunday. I mean, most of them are not working tomorrow. Why couldn't we do it tomorrow? I wanted to roll down my window and say, Jog to church! Go to church! So many, so many think that hearing God's word and receiving what Christ wants to give them through his means of grace is not that important. Running five or six or ten miles, that is. They aren't here. You are. There are plenty who take their salvation for granted and don't really care if their faith dies, but that is not you. You have come where needy people come, and you have done so in faith, with the object of your faith being your Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, who has redeemed you. You pray for and you seek His mercy, which He freely gives, whereby you offer your thanks for the mercy that has been shown to you. You, beloved, are like the Samaritan who has fallen at Christ's feet. And thus you can say with the psalmist, I love the Lord because He has heard my voice and my pleas for mercy. And what does our Lord say to you? Arise, go in peace, because your faith has saved you. In the holy name of Jesus, amen. Now may the peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and your minds through Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. We rise for prayer.